Hello, all you hardcore boxing fans out there. How are you doing? It's Porky here, the voice of hardcore boxing, but you already know that, don't you? That's why you've tuned in. Mm. I'm joined today by my good friend Terry from London. How are you doing, Terry? Well, I'm all right. You know, like I've been, I've literally been working for two hours up until this point. Have you? See what I mean? Yeah, today's a nightmare. Just like meeting after meeting after meeting. So it's, I don't know how this has happened. You're still working from home, Terry? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm, good man. Uh, there's been a lot gone on in boxing in last, since we last spoke. Uh, obviously, the, the main news is, and a lot, not a lot of people will pick up on this because they're not a lot of as deep as, as hardcore fans, but it looks like everybody's scrambling for slots now, doesn't it? Which is what you predicted months ago, didn't you? Yeah. I've noticed that uh, people are now putting themselves on YouTube every single day, doing three and four interviews. I've just seen the Dave Caldwell 57-minute one. And then, lo and behold, he's in, he's in other interviews with other outlets. Is it because they're panicking and they want to keep themselves out there and in the mix, or is it boredom? I mean, why are these people not in the gyms? What's going you on? You know what it is, Russ? It's, it's like ancient Rome, right? The closer you were to the emperor, the more likely you were to get an opportunity. So if you think about Eddie right now, Eddie cares about, he cares about what, 20 slots between now and the end of the year? That's all he cares about, right? 20 slots. Now, let's say Joshua's got one. Dillian's got one. Usyk's got one. Well, she saw an Usyk have one. Dillian and Povetkin have another one. And so as you go down that list, you're like, well, when are my guys going to fight on a matchroom show? When are my guys going to fight on a Frank Warren show? And the reality is not that often because a lot of these trainers and managers were milking the system, just throwing their guys on as undercard bouts, giving us rubbish fights, taking soft opponents. And all of a sudden, Eddie's now clocked it and Eddie's gone, hmm, I just need guys who are prepared to risk it all. Because I think we've talked about this before, Russ, I think probably privately. Eddie doesn't care if guys win or lose. He's, he's not bothered by that. He's bothered about whether these are people the public want to watch. And that's what he's done with his programming so far. So credit where credit's due. Here's one thing I'll give Hearn credit for. Apart from Joshua, he doesn't need anyone. He don't care, does but, he? No, he doesn't. He just, and, and this is what I do like about him. He can afford to be objective to an extent. So let's say, for example, let's say Liam Cameron did 300,000 views on Sky. Hearn would have got his license reinstated in a heartbeat and Liam Cameron would be boxing on Sky. Yeah. Hearn doesn't care. He just... He, that's, he legit doesn't care. And a lot of these boxers were under the impression Hearn cared about them. He doesn't. Hearn cares about Hearn. He cares about Matchroom. And if you're not helping his cause, mate, you're on the shelf. And you deserve to be. I heard a story that he was up at the Smith's house in Liverpool having a cuppa and a piece of cake with him all, you know, not so long ago. And uh, they probably felt that he was one of them. But look what's happened to Callum and Liam. And they probably can't get their heads round it because they're both threatening to retire at the end of the year, aren't they, Callum and Liam? Yeah. Well, another thing we've talked about was the... So go back a year ago, basically British boxing was a chess game. So for years, Frank, had, he had Yorkshire when he had Warrington, right? And that used to annoy Hearn because Warrington outsold Kel Brook in Yorkshire easily. So Hearn then gets Warrington. He doesn't really need Warrington now because he's not selling shows. He's just doing televised events. And no one really knows who Josh Warrington is outside of, you know, real boxing fans. Yeah. Same thing with the Smith brothers. Who really knows who the Smith brothers are unless you're a boxing fan? Yeah. So he doesn't need the Smith family because he's not trying to sell out Liverpool. So that's why they're not boxing. Do you think that Eddie's punishing Warrington uh, for, for leaving him before? Because when I look at it... I look at Josh Warrington, Callum Smith, Eddie, Billy Joe. Uh, uh, Eddie didn't deliver world titles for them. Sourland <clears throat> got Callum his title, didn't they? Frank Warren delivered for Warrington and Billy Joe twice. You see where I'm coming from? 100%. Um, and I, I said it at the time. I think I've got a podcast episode about Warrington going to Matchroom. And I just thought, this is career suicide. 
you've gone from being one of the top guys on BT Sport, and you can knock BT as much as you want, but when you're a top guy, you get treated differently. Yeah. You're now just an average guy in the Matchroom Empire. In the mix. Yeah. And and maybe maybe Warrington's initial view was, I'm just going to jump on that DAZN money train. But the DAZN money train is now ground to a halt because they can't afford what they were talking about a year ago. He's in limbo, Josh Warrington, now, isn't he, really? I mean, he's number one of his division on box rec, same as Callum Smith. But they're not spoke about, are they? Well, you wouldn't want to. They're, they're, they're career-ending fights, really, for, for other people. Like, Callum Smith's a nightmare to box. Warrington's a nightmare to box. And so they need really powerful promoters who will back them. And all of a sudden, Hearn has, Hearn has shown his true colours. And he said, I'm only putting people on that can get me the maximum bang for my buck. Warrington's an expensive fight to put on because he can only fight people like a Frampton or an Isaac Dogbo, and those are expensive fights. Callum Smith is an expensive fight. So what Eddie was hoping was he could just whack him into the Canelo mix, then he doesn't have to pay for that or carry the risk. But Canelo's like, why do I want to fight Callum Smith? It's a waste of my time. It does nothing for me. And it's the same with Warrington. Now Bob's like, well, you were on our side before you left. We don't need you now. Yeah, he's in limbo, Warrington, isn't he, in his peak years. And what about Billy Joe? What do you think is going to happen to him now? Billy Joe doesn't care about... He doesn't care whether he boxes or not. Like, he doesn't box for the money. Billy Joe will happily box whenever, however, wherever. I don't think it really bothers him. And I kind of like his attitude because Billy knows people always want to watch him. Yeah. So he's not panicking. But he's... We've seen the best of Billy Joe Saunders, in my opinion. So whatever people want to say, we will never see a better version of Billy Joe than we saw against the Mew. We just won't, just because Father Time catches up with everyone. Mm. All right, then, moving on. Uh, Joe Gallagher did an explosive interview on uh, some down-market YouTube channel the other day, and he basically said that Matchroom are racist against Natasha Jonas that his fighters are not getting a fair shake. Do you feel that Eddie Earn is squeezing Gallagher to take these fights for less money because Warren and Gallagher won't work together? So one thing I like about Joe Gallagher is he puts his fighters first. He will get them the most money for the least amount of risk, right? That's one thing I really like about him. He, he's a guy you'd, wanna, you'd want on your side. The problem with Joe Gallagher is also he's ruining his fighters' legacies. Now, from what I gather, the issue is he wanted the rematch with Terry Harper. But Eddie said, that can wait. Just get Tasha on the 14th of November show. You know I mean, keep the money ticking over. And Gallagher's been stubborn and said, no, we want the rematch like we were promised. And so they've just gone back and forth on that. So Eddie's gone, right, we've moved on. We're going to put someone else on that bill. And, and Gallagher's, everyone's got to realise like I said before, there are about 20 slots available on Matchroom between now and the end of the year. You can't dictate terms. Unless you're Joshua, you're not dictating terms to him. He'll just move on. Yeah. Yeah. You, you saw the other day, who's the, who was the kid? Rylan Clark. Yeah. People are grabbing the opportunity to be televised with both hands right now. Hearn doesn't have to beg. No, yeah. Lads are saying, I'll fight on Matchroom shows for free. Yeah, I've, I've heard some people trying to get on Dennis's show next month in a car park in Sheffield, practically begging. Do you know what I mean? Inundated with people wanting to box, and for for very very. Wait, 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 wait hold on. But you're you're head of boxing, so you should know who's. who's I, don't, I don't wait with Dennis no more. We've parted company as regards boxing. We're still. Uh, what? Well, 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 when was this going to come up? When will when will we going to get the Porky exclusive? So there's no exclusive. I don't agree with a lot of things that go on and we're boxing with what Dennis does. And I've moved on and he's moved on. Good luck to him. Ah, uh, man, you know, I'm going to say this now. You're probably the greatest head of boxing we've ever seen. <laughs> we wish Dennis well because he's a character, isn't he? All right, then, <laughs> moving on. Well, not so too much. I'll have Dennis put me in his crusher. <laughs> uh, moving on. Uh, do you feel that a lot of people now are scrambling for slots? I know we spoke about this earlier, but 
do you feel that there's a bit of desperation now in the in the fact that people are desperate to get out, like you predicted in March? Well, where are they getting their money from, Paul? Yeah, I know. You see what I mean? Everyone, people were arrogant. So I, listen, I spoke to a few boxers throughout the lockdown. I trained a few of them throughout the lockdown. The attitudes have definitely changed as the months have gone on. Because yeah. back in March, everyone thought it would be back to normal by the summer. Then we got to May Bank holiday. They thought it'd be back to normal by September. Now we're into October. We're like, this might not be normal for another six to nine months. Mm. So how are you gonna listen? If you're a small hall boxer, if you're a ticket seller, if you're one of those guys right now, you're not really a boxer. If you can't put eyes on on a TV screen right now, you're not a boxer. I think that's so why if, Dave Allen's getting the slots. Well, Dave Allen hasn't boxed, if I'm right. Yeah, he hasn't boxed since Darch, has he? Yeah, so so who what slots does Dave Allen get it? If if you really wanted Dave Allen, he'd have he'd have boxed in the in the original fight camp. Dave Allen's not needed anymore because you got Fabio Wardley and you got these Hearn's got heavyweights already. He doesn't need him and and people are starting to warm to Fabio Wardley. Do you feel that uh Dave's been left in cold now because as of uh last night, uh Hamer's got coronavirus. And Did you get it from you? I, I don't know, probably. <laughs> but wait, 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 hold on, Russ. I remember getting the message that you had, you, you tested positive, and then all of a sudden everyone starts falling like flies. And I was like, <laughs> Porky's really going after them. <laughs> well, I got it the same day Peter Fury got it. And uh, I said to oh. him, I've just seen you in an interview. And you look rough. He says, oh, I've had, a, I've, a, I've had a bit of a cough since uh, weekend. Anyway, I saw well, that's when I got mine. Anyway, when he were waiting for his test, I had a text off Phil Jeffries saying, we've had our tests, we're, neg- we're negative, because they all got them at 10 in the morning. <laughs> Savannah had had hers. Anyway, 22-11, Peter was still waiting for his result. <laughs> so I, I said to my mate, I said, I bet Peter's got it. Anyway, he had it. He got it. They smuggled him out, didn't they? The only thing missing was a blanket on his head. <laughs> uh, as he's coming out, Bellio is coming in. He's he's uh, gone. What's gone on? He's obviously found out. Straight on phone to Eddie, and got his fight to the slot. Which you can't blame Bellio for that, can you? Really? Oh, he's Bellio's like the kiss of death because then he tried this with Craig Glover as well, and then he got he got beat. Like. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> And then he was, I'm sure he was linked to Tommy McCarthy as well when he wasn't doing too well. Well, you just wants his cut, doesn't he? He's not bothered about fighters. He's treating fighters like he were treated. Yeah, pieces of meat. Like, but just come. Like David Day's doing with Chisora. Pimps. Yeah, let me just, let's bring it back to Dave. Dave's problem is you could put Dave on a slot when Dave was 20 to 30 grand a fight, right? Mm. Because he was, he, for, for, for the interest he got you, he was quite cheap. Now that Dave is asking for six figures per fight, he's quite an expensive guy to have on the show. Mm. So why are you having Dave Allen on there? Is Dave going to fight for a British? No. Is Dave going to fight for a world? No. Dave's an expensive guy to have on. You you don't, in this current climate, you don't need him because we're not selling tickets. Well, they put Savannah Marshall on the slot now, aren't they, last night? But you may as well. Right, because everyone's going to be sat at home, so you're going to be sat there with your wife or your girlfriend, and she can watch it now. Now she can watch it with you. So, so Sky can say, "Look, in the current climate, we've got female boxers. We're drawing in a female audience. We can sell to different brands now. We can sell to more family-oriented brands." Makes sense. Uh, Dave's out there calling out Fabio Wardley this morning on IF. Uh, not Fabio Wardley. Uh, Glenroy Thomas. This morning, on but Lenroy Thomas has booked in to fight in Tampa, Florida, twenty first of November. Will Lenroy Thomas drop that fight to come over to England? I don't see well, that. Yo. A waste of time. Well, what, what what fight card is it going to enhance? None of them. We, we we've moved on from from Lenroy, and Lenroy hasn't done anything to be interesting to us. Yeah, but Dave, what chief support for Usyk Chisora? Will Hearn now drop that? And and stick with what he's got and leave Dave in the cold. Okay, so do I think Lenroy Thomas is as good as Christian Hammer? No. no. So 
Hearn understands to be chief support is going to have to be a challenging fight. So you're going to have to put Dave in there with someone who can really go. Yeah. Who's available? Uh, uh, 10 days notice. You might. You might ask someone like, you, you, you want a rematch with Yoka? Oh, God. Yeah, exactly. You want Hergovic? No. No, he'll not take them, will he? No. So, so who are you going to put him in with that we're going to care about? There's no, no one. Dave, in with Yoka and Ergovic, I'd really be worried for his health, mate, to be honest. And Erna would be called, Erna be known as a sadist, wouldn't he, if you put them, put them on? I mean, I they reckon Yoka secretly is the hardest puncher in world boxing at the moment, don't they? That's what people are saying around the gyms and that. He is the hardest puncher in world boxing. They reckon he's a massive puncher. He's he's this weird mix, right? If you look at him, he's if someone told you that language, looks marketable, Terry, doesn't he? If Tony Yoka could speak English, we wouldn't be talking about Joshua. No, so we'll some... be talking about Yoka, an Olympic gold medalist, and he don't get a look in, does he? Because he doesn't speak English. I know, but but he's massive in France. Have you seen that? So so the oh, sports yeah, yeah. have a Tony Yoka range, right? And he does really good numbers in France. So when people say, why doesn't he come over here? Him and his wife, because his wife's a gold medalist as well. So <laughs> they're the golden couple of France and they represent all of these wonderful things. Here, here's a French couple, mm. both of Congolese origin, but they've also got French parents. Mm. They've won gold medals for their country. They box, they look good. If they spoke English, it will be game over for so many people. But yeah. they make so much money in France, they don't need to. He's massive in France, isn't he? He's a national hero. He's, uh, I've seen, I've seen a, a bit of a, a profile on him. It's 200 metres in 21 seconds and that. He could have turned his hand to anything. He's like another Joshua, isn't he? You know, just an athlete. But I think he's got a bit more in his locker than Joshua, do you? He's been boxing since he was a kid, mate. He, yeah. he's, he, he can really, really box. Yeah. You know, he wasn't like Joshua kind of muscled his way to an Olympic gold medal. Mm. Yoka had a, like a busted ankle and he used his boxing brain to to keep Joe Joyce off him. So I'm a big Yoka fan. I think he's got the biggest upside of all of these guys. And he's one of the youngest as well, which people forget. And so, yeah, it's you're, you're not going to put him in with Dave. You're not going to put Dave in with it. But listen, it will end up being Dave Allen versus Tom Little, right? Let's just stop pretending. That, that's, yeah. where, that's where we will end up. Yeah, well, if that happens, I'd be glad, you know, because I like Tom Little. I, I, I've met him. He seems a nice kid. And he's hilarious. I always, he's hilarious, isn't he? Yeah. I always feel that Tom Little's not won a belt. Dave Allen's not won a belt. But why does Dave dismiss having a fight with Tom? Because th th there's not really much between them, is there, really? Yeah, but you know why that is, right? Why? Right. There's only one slot for the cheeky, funny guy in British boxing. And Tom could take that off Dave. If, if enough people knew who Tom Little was, people would be like, actually, this guy's funnier than Dave Allen. Yeah, yeah, I like, I like this Tom Little guy. And I look at it, and he's good mates with Billy Joe. Oh, okay, cool. I like this Tom guy. Do you feel, Dave... Terry, sorry, go on. Do you feel that uh, Dave dismisses a fight with Tom Little because he's been in with... Ortiz, Yoker, Price, White. But when you look at them fights, and Thomas as well, he, that's 51 rounds. He only won two rounds, and they were the Thomas rounds. So does does getting a good hiding off these people mean that you're above Tom Little? Because Tom Little's been in with some people as well, don't forget. I don't think it's that, Russ. I genuinely think it's... If you fight Tom Little and lose, Tom Little gets your slot. Yeah. Now you become relevant. So Dave's not stupid. Dave knows as long as he fights guys who are better than him, he can always play the underdog card. It's simple. And that's how he stays marketable. He just plays the underdog card. Is that how you think? It's, well, what a sort of mentality is that to go into boxing with? It's like they don't want to have a legacy or win a belt, isn't it? They just want to go out there and just be, get paid. Just get paid and just be known. It, it, it ain't moving. I don't call that progress, me. I don't honestly. I call it going backwards. I mean, it's going to be interesting. Now, I mean, Eddie Eddie Earn said two weeks ago that Alan Hamer is a crossroads fight for both. But how many crossroads fights are we going to see Dave in? 
Hey, full circle. It's <laughs> That's repeat, all it is. It's repeat and f and fade away, and then come back again and repeat, isn't it? For example, today we know when we turn our TVs on, we're going to have breaking news: Dave Allen IFL, breaking news: Boxing Social, Dave Allen. Then Instagram posts. It's going to be the same old thing, and and, and then it, it's just repeat and uh, repeat, and then again, in it, then it, it it's all these crossroad things. It, you know when you you know what a crossroad fight was years ago. Frotch Boutte for me were a crossroads fight. If he lost that, he said to me, "I am out of boxing." He he were done, Carl. I said, "Fair enough." So that's a crossroad fight, isn't it? Yeah, uh, he was lucky in that fight. He was genuinely yeah. lucky that Butte had food poisoning. Yeah. <laughs> Butte was training at Glen Road gym for that fight. And did you hear? Did you hear? Like, basically, Butte, what is it? He was warming up. He threw a jab. The bag fell off its mountings. Went to the other bag, threw I'm another jab. Sure. The other bag fell off. He didn't realize that he had a lot of power in that right hand, but he got food poisoning. So Carl got an easy ride. Stop digging out the Cobra. You know he's a legend. Right, going back to Dave Allen, who's he going to fight then now? Will he be put said, off the show? If he fights, he'll fight Tom Little. That, that, that I can't see it going anywhere I think else. that's a good fight, Dave and Tom Little, and I'd get behind that fight. It's not a chief support for a pay-per-view, Russ. Eh? It's not a chief support for a pay-per-view. I'm not paying 20 that, quid. Yeah. You know, I'd pay 20 quid to see Tom Little, not Tom Little versus Dave Allen. Like, I feel you'd be insulting the fans' intelligence by telling us that deserves to be on a pay-per-view platform. Would Dave take a fight with Ergovic? Ah, oh, listen, if you pay Dave the right amount of money, I'm sure he would. What about Fabio Wardley, Dave? Would that happen or isn't it a chief support? It's not really, for me, that's not a chief support either. Maybe they'll put Dave in with Babbage. Mm. Yeah, Babbage. What uh, well, could that be a chief support? No, Funny but, but... On social media. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the winner, the winner gets Rob Tebbers boxing social microphone. Yeah, yeah. Is that where we're at now? Dave Allen Babbage. Is that is that boxing in the tw in the twenty in the in the twenty twenties? Chief right, support it, on a paper. My... Should Del Boy Chisora be in a headliner? For his second pay per view on Sky with nine losses. Yes, and I tell you why, Russ. Right. Like we talked about earlier. Now it's about how many eyes can you get on the screen. Therefore, how many eyes can you get to pay for an event? So you need attractions. You don't need good boxers at this point. You need attractions. Derek's an attraction. There's no question about that. And he's in a fight that has meaning. So really, this is Derek carrying the show, if I'm being honest with you. And when Derek carries the show, he knows he's got the British public behind him because he's crossed over. People know Derek Chisora who aren't boxing fans. Who else can you say that about? It's, it's probably him, Joshua and Dillian. They're, they're your only pay-per-view options right now. Yeah. And so basically, if Chisora goes down... Sorry, if Chisora puts a good show up but gets obviously beat... Would he still be pay-per-view in his next fight, Chisora? Depends on who you put him in with. So let's say he loses, and let's say Povetkin wins. Him versus Dillian, number three, people would pay for that. Yeah. I think him versus Povetkin, if, if Dillian beats Povetkin, I think him versus Povetkin, I'd pay to watch. Yeah, well, if you remember, I, I did a video on this dinner a few weeks ago, and I, and I put all four guys there, and I said, look, these are going to fight each other, winners and losers, because it's the only pay-per-view... Fights that Ern can put on that the fans would complain about, but they still watch, wouldn't they? But it wouldn't be in as big a numbers as it will last year. It'll be smaller numbers, but it'll be enough for them to eat, won't it? Here's the thing, Russ. Boxing is a dying sport. Commercially, socially, it's a dying sport because the average age of a boxing fan is going up every year. We don't get fresh blood coming in. No, you know, Russ... You're probably the average age of a boxing fan right now. 50. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, you might be right there. I was looking at my analytics on YouTube the other day and the age groups, they are changing a little bit on the graphs and that. There's no young ones watching, you know, watching my channel. Yeah, there's just... 
youngsters just don't care about boxing. You're seeing it in the gyms. Like the kids, they'll come and they'll dabble in it, but they don't really want to get punched. Well, look the at face. them basketball ones. Look at the forums on them and the numbers they generate. Basketball, baseball, NFL, massive. Yeah, it's absolutely insane. I, I always say if I was going to do a media outlet now, starting from scratch, I'd have done something like basketball. And look at because, me with boxing. It's less less views than fishing. <laughs> yeah, but 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 at least with you, Russ, your numbers are genuine. Like yeah. I was looking, I was looking at Coogan's Instagram. He did a video with Hearn, right? And it got fifty seven thousand views. Coogan's only got one hundred thirty seven thousand followers. Now Instagram are very careful about this, right? They manage your exposure. So take an example, David Beckham. David Beckham's most recognizable man in Britain. I don't care. I don't want to hear an argument against this. Yeah. He's more recognizable than Joshua. He's more recognizable than anyone in this country. Yeah. David Beckham has like 65 million followers. 65 uh, if, million? Something like that. Maybe more. Yes. If he does a post, it might get to one and a half million, right? Mm. That's what that that's what one in forty of his followers get to see it. Yeah. So how's Coogan got a penetration rate of close to forty percent, and Beckham's is like two and a half percent? That doesn't make any sense, right? Mm. And that shows you these guys are cooking numbers up, because I know they can say, "Oh, well, this is how YouTube works." Cool. Okay, I'll plead ignorance on that. You can't tell me how Instagram works. I know exactly how Instagram works because. I've worked with, with the Facebook group. I know how it works. They will never allow you to have 50% visibility because, because then you become too valuable and they can't sell the real estate on a phone screen. So these guys are just cooking numbers up. It's a joke. Yeah, I've noticed that on, on a few. Because I, I always think... I, look, I, was, I was looking at uh, Sporting Icons the other day. He's got 52,000 subscribers and he just same numbers as me. And I've got ten percent less subscribe. I'm just over. I think I'm about four thousand one hundred subscribers, and he, he's fifty two thousand. But he's not no not much better than me. So where are all his other subscribers? Are they not watching? There you go. It's it, it's a dirty game, and what it does is it creates this false impression that boxing is this booming sport. It isn't. Boxing is literally men with grey hair with bellies and the shirt hanging over the jeans, drinking a pint of Worthington's. That's what boxing is. Worthington's. Free plug for Worthington's. <laughs> you could have said black sheep beer. That's what I drink. <laughs> yeah, but I didn't want to take shots at you, Porks. All right. Nice one. Uh, moving on then. Uh, big, massive talking point at the weekend. People saying that Eddie Earn threw Ritson under the bus. And that he's, obviously he's not a matchroom fighter, but Ern was saying he was, but I know he isn't because I've heard from Orso's mouth. The Ritson situation and Terry O'Connor, who were up in front at board yesterday at Cardiff, and there's no action being taken. Oh, he did, did, did he just get a, st a strong talking to, did he? I don't know, but Robert Smith came out on IFL and on Sunday, on Sunday morning, just as he were right, ready to play golf, apparently. And he basically said, no, you can't question us. Nobody's allowed to say anything to them. Man, I saw, so I saw the interview. Yeah. Uh, and number one, he looked hungover as fuck. Yeah. Did like. you know Robert Smith got done for drink driving and had a show for 18 months? Nobody, everybody seems to forget all this, don't they? Who paid for the show for? Well, I don't know. Probably Robert Smith paid for it, but I don't know how. But yeah, he was driven about for 18 months when they got banned. I mean, what, what, what's all that about? Unless he did a course and it got reduced to a year. But Robert Smith, I know people who've had their license took off and by you for drink driving and you give people dressings down. You're supposed to be in a position of authority. Unbelievable. They're just doing what they want, Terry, aren't they? But point I want to make is Robert Smith seemed pompous and arrogant in that interview with the, uh, the, the IFL lad. I forgot. Is it Oscar Beavis? Yeah. So, okay. So I spoke to some guys who were who were close to those events, and also what happened was, after the fight, Hearn jumped straight on IFL, which he probably regrets now. 
Yeah. And he's talking like a fan. And he's like, man, that judging was shocking. I had Ritson losing. We can't keep having judging like this in the UK. Da, 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 da. He's speaking, Hearn speaking like a fan and he's being himself, right? But the mistake he's made is, I'm going to have a word with the board. So all of a sudden, you've shifted this onto the board. Now the board have to react because yeah. Hearn's the biggest name in British boxing who's not called Joshua. Yeah. So now the board are like, oh, Hearn's put us under pressure. Smith comes out first thing on Monday. They filmed that at like seven o'clock or something. Ridiculous. Sunday morning it was, wasn't it? Yeah, so it was ridiculously early. Robert Smith comes out. You can see he looks like he's just got out of bed after yeah, a heavy night. They'll have, been out, they'll have had a heavy night, won't they, on Bar Bill? And then the problem Smith had is all Robert Smith had to do in that interview is say, I understand why the fans are upset because, you know, they saw one thing and that's fine. He went on attack though, didn't he? Yeah, he just he slagged everyone off. He was disrespectful. And what he did is he basically said the people who buy the tickets are idiots and he doesn't care what they think. Yeah. And if I'm a boxing fan at this point, I'm like, there you go. The truth is out. It's that simple. Now, let's talk about Terry O'Connor. Russ, if you look at Terry O'Connor's decisions, he only seems to get it wrong when someone's got a big fight coming up next. So let's look at the ones he's got wrong. He got Fury versus McDermott wrong, right? Fury was, I think that was around the time Fury was meant to be fighting Chisora or someone of that level. So they were looking to step him up and make a bit more money off him. Yeah. Um, who else Fury has he got McDermott. Wrong? Hmm? Fury McDermott, 98, 92. Parker yeah. under an 18, Yui Fury. Okay, no, 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 don't rush, don't rush, Russ, don't rush. Let's oh. go through them one by one, okay? Huey Fury versus Joseph Parker. Parker was meant to fight Joshua as long as he held on to that belt. That was going to be the fight. Yeah? yeah? You think Joshua wanted to fight Huey Fury? No. There you go. Not a coincidence that O'Connor gets it wrong there. Then who was the other one? Uh, Tyson Fury McDermott, 98-92. We, we just touched on that one. That was when Tyson was oh, getting yeah. ready to, yeah. to fight You know the, the great and the good in British boxing. So... Now you start to see it. Look where they've got Ritson. Ritson was primed to fight Josh Taylor. Yeah. Right? So this Vasquez fight was meant for him to say, look, I got rid of Vasquez. O'Hara Davis couldn't do it. O'Hara was lucky. I wasn't lucky. I think I could have a chance against Josh Taylor. That's where they wanted to take that. Mm. But Ritson was so bad. You know, Connor's there. I bet he was looking at his phone and basically saying to, to her or whoever pulls the strings, Mate, I can't give this to Ritson. It's terrible. And he just got a message back, do as you're told. Because think about this, Russ. I find it weird that it takes so long for judges to pull these scorecards together, if you see what I mean. I'm like, yeah. wait, wait. You've been scoring the round after the text round. message, aren't they? Hmm? The waiting at the end of the fight for the text message from the promoter. Exactly. It takes ages for cards to be added up at yeah. the end. Because yeah. if you look at O'Connor's history, Russ, he doesn't get many cards wrong. No. Right? It's just when, like, look what he did with Froch Grove. Mm. Yeah? Froch wasn't meant to fight George. We all know that. And they had bigger plans for Carl because, you know, Carl needed those big cash-out fights so he couldn't lose the belts. So Terry O'Connor just put him in that chokehold immediately. He went, right, got him. No, that was Howard yeah. Foster. Hmm? That was Howard Foster who choked Groves. Was that Howard Foster? Yeah, Raul Foster. Ah, bollocks. That, that, that kills that one. But still, if you look at all the other guys that Connor's got it wrong with, it's all guys who had bigger fights lined up. And if they had lost then, there's a lot of money down the toilet. Because you're either trying to get buzz or you're trying to cash out. And I think these judges understand that. They may not get direct instructions, but they'll get a hint where it'll be like, look, once Ritson wins this, guys, we want him to fight Josh Taylor. You know, you probably get you probably get a judging gig on that as well if you fancy it. So all of a sudden, you want Ritson to win, yeah. Subconsciously, as a judge, you want Ritson to win because you're like, mate, I want Ritson versus Taylor, and they know how to do this, man. It, it's clever psychological warfare. And so, do I think the board will punish Terry O'Connor? No. And Russ, we know why because they dare not have any of their A star referees come out and start telling tales. So they yeah. just keep them sweet. 
Yeah, that's how that's been going. It's been going on for far too long, though. Now, hasn't it? Knows us in the truck. It will. It will never change. The only option fans have is just to walk away from boxing. I think that's it's time people do that. Well, just people, well, there's something going on now on social media because people are absolutely sick to the back teeth of the boxing board of control, and people want change. It, 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 boxing's sliding down the pan. And it looks like to me like promoters are scrambling to get as much money in as they, as they can before it implodes. They'll know the numbers and what's going on behind the scenes and they'll know that they could be in trouble. Warren will know and her, they're gagging for Joshua Fury, aren't they? Well, so look, look, look at it from a board perspective, right? Most of the money those guys make is from l- having loads of shows on here, there and everywhere. There are no shows. There are none. So how are the board making their money right now? They're making their money from Hearn and Warren. Yeah. That's it. So how are they independent out of interest? How are the British board independent when the people funding them right now is two promoters? Yeah, basically. Oh, and, and McHennessy, sorry. Mm. And Dennis has got two shows coming up, hasn't he? But yeah, two classics. Two classics, but it's not... Uh... It's not good. There, to me, there are a load of. It's an old boys' club. There are a load of old farts, men in the seventies that elected themselves onto something, and just all they're doing is just poncing off people. There's poncers, a load of old poncers, mate, and it wants ripping up and starting again. We are proper. Do you remember years ago when they ripped, ripped the football league up and said, "Right, we're going to do it Premier League." They ripped it all up and they started again. And Premier League now is the best export that we've got in it in sport. And right, Russ, but, but 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 why why is it we don't catch all of these premiership guys failing drugs tests? We know they're out there sniffing coke. We know they're out there taking all kinds of medication they shouldn't be taking. We know this like they get exposed on social media regularly. Yet you can't seem to just leave them alone. Mate, it's the sport's dirty. Mm. All sports are dirty because there's too much money at stake. No one wants to be the person who ruins the money. Do you feel that the that 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 was why VAR stitched Liverpool up at the weekend because the, the it were better for bookies to have a draw? I mean, I've read that today in a paper. No, I won't go that far. Sometimes you're well, just. Why can you get it wrong if you've got VAR? <laughs> well, so he, so. You see, I come from a sport, rugby, where we've had these television match officials for ages. There's still bits where it's interpretation. So what rugby's tried to do is just make everything logical. So was there physical contact? Yes. Was it to the face? Yes. Red card. That, that, there's no, no interpretation required. If it's two ticks, you're off. And I think football needs to get to that point when it uses VAR. Yeah. Uh, moving on then, Tyson Fury against Caballel or TBA and Joshua against Pulev with Charlie Martin as the plan B if Pulev you know, has to pull out from because of virus or injury or anything. Could they sell Charlie Martin, Joshua? And could they sell Fury, Caballel as pay-per-view? I'd like to see that... If you switch those opponents around, I think it gets more interesting, actually. What do you mean, Joshua so think, against Caballel and Charlie Martin yeah, against because, Joshua? Because Caballel sparred Joshua. Um, yeah. Did he spar? Because Caballel's Southpaw. I think he might have... Did he spar him for the Martin fight he, or something? He, he, Chisora, didn't he? Yeah. But oh. I think that that style would be a nightmare for Joshua. So it'd be good to, to watch him learn and develop from that. But also, I think Charles Martin would be a nightmare for Fury because Fury's not a high work rate guy like Joshua is. You know, Joshua's speed and power. Whereas Fury's more methodical. And Charles Martin can deal with that a lot easier. So I think that'd be a more entertaining fight. I think the, the pre-fight build-up would be immense between Charles Martin and Tyson Fury. I'd quite like to see that, actually. Yeah, but Charles Martin, he's, he's C-class, isn't he? No, 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 no. I don't think that's fair. No. Um, n- no, he's he he belongs in that middle tier. So I'd put him in. You could put him in with guys like Dubois and that. And that he's in that conversation for he's me. He's a top fifteen guy, isn't he? Yeah, 
yeah, yeah, comfortably. Fury's a number one guy, so a, a 15 guy against a number one guy. That how could they sell that? Well, he's a former champion. That's all they could. No, do. Russ, Russ, Russ. You gotta understand why the fights have, the fights is to stay busy fighting. Yeah, that's you why know? I'm coming to that. Yeah, before you jump down my throat, pal. He, he's a oh, former. No. Wow. <laughs> 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 no, he's a former champion. They could sell it like that, but it's just a, a non-risk fight before the big one, isn't it? Or the big two, because they're gonna fight twice, aren't they? Yeah. And I understand Fury doesn't want to get rusty. He already had two and a bit years out. If you look at boxing history, this is the first era we haven't allowed guys at the top to have piss poor fights. Ali's got loads of them on his record. Yeah. If someone said to you, name me 10 Ali fights. After about number four, you're lost. Uh, there's, there's all kinds of rubbish he's got in there, like when he fought Quarry or when he fought Bob Foster and outweighed him by 40 pounds. There's all sorts of fights that if they happened now, we'd be laughing. Well, that's just like Mike Tyson fighting Spinks. That Spinks was good, though. Man. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Bob Foster was good, though, wasn't he? There's a light everywhere. No, wait, wait, wait. No, no, no. But, but Bob Foster literally came up from light heavy to box at heavyweight and went back down to light heavy. He didn't even put on any weight. Mm. He walked into the ring at, I think it was 185 pounds. To fight Ali, who was probably about 215, 220. Mm. We can all do numbers, Russ. <laughs> uh, all right, then moving on. Do you think the Wilder's finished? I'm worried. I think it's strange. Like, boxers are very fragile people. I know we watch them fight and we think these are really hard men and really tough guys, but they're not. And that's why you see these guys fall apart when their missus leaves them. You see them fall apart when, when their career ends because they're mentally fragile creatures. And if you're not used to losing, it can affect you. And it looks like it's affected Wilder. Now, I don't know if it's affected him in the ring, but he's just not visible right now. And that always worries me that you've disappeared after a loss when you should really be visible and you should be telling us you're coming back. And so I am worried, but... I like Wilder, and I think what Wilder has, you don't lose. If he catches you, you're going to sleep. And the thing is, he can never lose that belief because when he does, he's just a, he's a really mediocre boxer. So he has to, to get that back. I'm surprised he got rid of Breland. Breland was like the only voice of reason in that camp. Yeah. Whatever hold Jay Diaz has over, over him, I, I, I don't know. But Jesus, get rid of that guy. Mm. Yeah, it's uh, interesting, interesting. All right, then. Uh, Kel Brook against Crawford. What do you think about Ryan Rhodes and Adam Etchett's training him? That's the word. And Sky and BT not being interested in buying the rights to the fight for the UK fans. And is that the same situation as Loma Lopez? Because there's no money in the pot. This is Kel Brook. How, how, how on earth are we going to allow Kel Brook to fight Terence Crawford and no one's putting their hand in their pocket? That, 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 for me, that's disgraceful because I don't think Kel's washed up. I don't think Kel is a viable opponent in this in terms of it being a 50-50. But Kel Brook will give us a few good rounds in that fight because he's got the right skill set. Kel Brook is not... He's not a manufactured fighter. He's a real boxer. Now, I, I would want to watch that. Now, whether I'd pay for on pay-per-view, nah, probably not. But it depends what card you give me. Yeah. That, that, I think that's my take. In terms of him training with Ryan Rhodes, well, Ryan, Ryan's known him. I mean, like, we were all in the gym together back in, like, God knows when. Is that, like, 03? That probably is. But we were all knocking about in the same gym together. So... I'm I'm happy. I hope Kel finds peace because he doesn't need a trainer now. Kel knows who he is. Kel knows what he can do. He just needs someone to get him to that start line in his best possible shape. And then hopefully for at least four or five rounds, he gives Crawford hell. Well, what about the white flex wheeler uh, refusing to train him with because there were only six weeks left? <sighs> uh, he's got his new toys now, hasn't he? He's got Bradley Skeet, so he's happy. 
Who's got Bradley Skeet? Big Dom. Has he got Bradley Skeet now? Oh, my God. Willie Hutchinson, Bradley Skeet. And Liam, yeah. Liam Williams, who most improved fighting in world boxing, they're saying, at the moment. Well, well, he hasn't really fought anyone. Let's be absolutely clear about this. Liam Williams needs to fight someone. But they've manufactured a number one spot for him. Yeah, but I mean, we'll see what he does against Demetrius Andrade. I'm tired of hearing people talk about this guy is this, he's that. No, they seem tested. Well, I think Liam Williams is a good fighter, but once he's been hit, like Liam, Liam Smith put it on him, he were, he, he were looking for a way out when he both fights. That's what I mean. Like, what happens when you're tested? Can you keep coming We saw what happened when Kel Brook was tested against Triple G and Spence, didn't we? Tower came in, didn't it? So I think there were probably two different scenarios. In the first fight, the plan had always been to throw the towel in. It was literally Kel, go out there, look spectacular, bang, bang, bang. As soon as Golovkin starts sticking it on you, it's going to put the towel in there. We've got our money, job done, reputation enhanced. There you go. And we've still got an IBF 147 belt to defend. Yeah. Had he not broken his eye socket, that would have been one of the best fucking ram raids of all time. Mm. Ram raids. <laughs> it would have been, yeah. They got, they got away unscathed, wouldn't they? But they got caught out. Yeah. And we all predicted it, saying, look, this is dangerous. This guy can hurt you. We have weight divisions for a reason. Fighters are not superheroes. And everybody went, yeah, yeah, yeah. Listen, Kel's a beast. He's really a super middle. <laughs> well, am I right? Eddie Hearn's words. Am I right? It's on IFL. Kel's a beast. Okay. Kel's a okay. beast. Okay, so so as an example, George Groves is a super middleweight. George walks around in the high 80s before he gets down to super middle. So does Kel Brook <laughs> before he gets down to 47. But, but yeah, but he's got puffy cheeks. George looks like, George just looks like, like, like he can do damage at any weight class. When, he, when, he, when George is getting ready for a fight, he's in shape and he's heavy. Like, Kel Brooks, the guy just eats too many Haribo. Groves had a stone on Frotch in the first fight, you know. Listen, he had bricks in his fists, never mind a stone. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> But uh, Kel Brook, does he beat Crawford? No, no. Does the towel no. come in? I think the towel comes in and then that's probably Kel done. There's a point. There's a point in Kel's career where he could have beaten Crawford. Like that, that kind of 2014 to 2015 vintage of Kel could have beaten Crawford. Nothing after that tells me he could have beaten Crawford. Do you feel that uh, the Eddie Earn interview, I'm not sure if it's Boxing Social or IFL, uh, the last five minutes, I think it's Boxing Social, where he's asked about Kel Brook and he more or less said, they did the fight without me and they're out on their own. Do you feel that were Earn at his worst or do you think it was just ice-cold businessman Hearn? Well, I think it's just the reality, right? Kel, Kel's got nothing... F- you know, Eddie's got nothing for Kel right now. What, what fight can you make apart from the Amir Khan fight? That's the in the pandemic right now, where you really want to be selling pay per view events. That's the only fight the British public will pay to see Kel in is the Amir Khan fight. Amir's never going to give it to him, as we've been saying for years. Khan was never going to give Kel that fight, and all he did was use Eddie as a as a cash point and just get some money out. And so, for me, Kel. Kel had every right to do that because n- name me a really good fight that Eddie's delivered for Kel. Apart from really? Sean Porter. Uh, Sean Porter, I thought I thought he did all right in that fight, but I thought he just lost that fight. But I was glad he won because I was cheering him on cheering him on. That were in America though, wasn't it? So he didn't bring Porter over here. But that that's the first one he delivered for him. I don't see any others that he's really delivered for him. He threw him under the bus against Golovkin. So he could save his deposit on the Eubank uh, Triple G fight. The Errol Spence fight, he should have never been in that fight. He should have just moved up away and left that division. Well, well, Hearn didn't even make that fight. Spence was mandatory. It had to happen or give the belt up. 
Yeah, I know, but Kel should have just given the belt up and, and stayed as a pay-per-view fighter at 154 and gone after the Charlos and that. I mean, we kept hearing that he were going to do this and going to do that, but when he was with Frank Warren, he knocked back Mike Jones and there were another guy who were a massive puncher. He knocked back Tim Bradley. There were fight after fight after fight and that he knocked back with Warren and in the end, Warren washed his hands. And a bit like he did with Billy Joe, and really, once they leave Warren, what has Earn done for any fighter? Liam Smith, Billy Joe, Kel Brook. Yeah, he, he delivered a world title for Kel Brook, Eddie Earn. So well done, Eddie Earn. But really, he didn't want to build a legacy for Kel Brook. He wanted to build build bank balances, didn't he? And the kid got injured in process. And I think that we're looking at probably so. He's a lot of people's number one pound for pound, Crawford, isn't he? Is he your number one? Nah. But he's in nah. the top five, isn't he? He's in the conversation. Yeah. But he can't be pound for pound number one because we already have a boxer who, who lives among us that has gone up and down the weights and won belts. Like, Canelo's done that. That's pound yeah. for pound. Okay. So, Crawford... He's, he's in the conversation, and we've got a British kid called Kelbrook who spilt his guts for Matchroom and Sky. He's going out there to America, and TV in England don't want to buy it. And Eddie Earn were umming and ahhing and playing God in that interview with Tebba. He were playing God like he's pulling the strings at Sky. And Kelbrook and his stepdad have got to sit there now, and they've got to think, God, we deserve better than this. So I hope that Kel Brook, Ryan Rhodes, and Adam Etchis go out there and pull something off and say, fuck you, Eddie Earn. We're going to go back. Well, no, to the no, no, this is all Kel's fault. Kel should have left her. All Kel would have had to do, I think, didn't I message this, this to you before? All Kel would have had to do was say, Eddie, I'm, I'm going to join PBC because they've got all the welterweights. I'm just going to be part of that mix for two or three years and make my money. That's what he should have done. So, so how did they get that so wrong? If we can see it here as as cornflake crunches, if we can see it on this side of the line, why can't oh, they see it? crunches? How 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 stupid are Team Brook that they didn't see that was where all the money was? Yeah, and do you feel if Cal Brook gets beat against Crawford, that he's used all his avenues to, to get money? Do you feel that? He'll then take any offer against Amir Khan and go fight Khan on BT Sport. Khan will never give him the fight. Khan, Khan will. Khan must love watching this desperation. He's just laughing his head off. I think, depending on how Kel performs, he'll just be a name for hire. If let's say Crawford does him in six or seven rounds, then if I'm Al Heyman, I'll get him in for for my young welterweights. Maybe put him in with Jerome Ennis, get a good name on his record. You know, Kel just becomes a name for sale. Do you think it would be Kel Brook against Beefy Smith and then Cheeseman and Eggington? He'll go down that route and just be picking up 40s and 50s. I think you and I have spoken about this before, haven't we? Mm. And I said, he may as well just go to America and sell his name over there. Yeah. Because if, if pay-per-view's the future for the next year and a half, then why are you here? Like, America's a bigger pay-per-view market. You may as well just go over there. Yeah. Maybe maybe Kelbrook might want to stay over there. Who knows? I mean, Tyson Fury's been over there a few years now, hasn't he? Yeah, man. Post up in Miami. I hear the gay seems pretty good over there. He'll be all right. Oof. That would have been below belt, Terry, wasn't it? <laughs> You'll get... <laughs> I don't know what to say to that. Uh, what next for Shannon Courtney? Ellie Scottney. And do you think she'll fight Rachel Ball after that? Listen, every, every one of those Brits has got to deal with Ellie Scott in the next 12 months or so. And she's just going to be dishing out hidings on top of hidings on top of hidings. Good so, luck, yeah. She, 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 she's, she's what women's boxing needed. You know when you see a, a woman who's prepared to just have it out, right? <laughs> you, you're getting hooks and uppercuts today. Like, no messing about straight in there. Mm. Ah, so you think that Shannon Courtney gets beat by her then? Yeah, comfortably. Like, like that's not... There's, there's nothing. You don't delay the fight. There's nothing you can do because 
Ellie's just cut from that cloth. Uh, you know when someone's been doing it from so young, it's just in them. And I'm looking forward to watching her career. Oh, interesting. All right, then. Well, listen, it's been a pleasure, Terry. Ah, oh, man, like, you know, I've enjoyed this. It's, it's, it's a therapy. I know you're working for more. Are you going to change your uh, profile picture? I, I don't like to see my man uh, looking up at Groves. <laughs> well, we, we all look up to George Groves in one way or another, Porky, don't we? Mm. Yeah, do you think he'll come back, Groves? No, no. So, like, I'm sure he lives in Richmond or somewhere near there now. And you'll see him floating around with his kids. He's got a bit of a gut. Ah, he's content with life. George is one of those guys who, if I'm wrong on this, you can correct me. I think he saw boxing as just a way to make a load of money without having to go to university and do all of that stuff. I think George had a functional relationship with boxing. And once he got out of it, what he needed, I think he was done. Mm. Well, that's good. It's a great story then, isn't it? If that's what's, that's what's happened to him. Yeah, I don't see him coming back. He looks like he's been smart with his money. Um, nah, he, he, he's done. Cobra plays golf every day. Yeah, but what does he play off of? I don't know if he's any good. I've, I've actually, I've, I've only been to golf place with him once and they were just at a driving range and he looks pretty all right. I think his son's a bit better than him. Rocco. I think, I think Ward would beat him at that too. Uh, <laughs> But I think if you can get in boxing, be a world champion and get out and be financially secure, I think that's good. But what I worry about is, is the fighters that don't get out financially secure and they're a bit damaged. There's nothing set up for these fighters. And I think no, they shouldn't good. be, Russ. No, they shouldn't be. Why because should I? when I talk to young boxers on their way up, I say to them, listen, boxing's just a platform. Boxing is a way for you to be seen by thousands of people. You need to work out what you're going to do with that platform. Like, let's take Anthony Fowler as an example. Mm. Anthony Fowler is like the face of CBD oil in boxing now, right? All he's done is use his, he's used his boxing profile as a platform. He's now doing the whole CBD thing. I hope he's making good money out of that. Mm. And that's what boxers should be doing. What can I use my platform to do? Mm. It's, well, once you start thinking about it as a job, I think that's when boxers struggle because you can't think about this as a job. Yeah, it's uh, it's exciting times ahead for those boxers that are uh, retiring with a few quid and the rest of them, I feel for them. I know, yeah, they should do something with the time instead, in, uh, instead of texting and tweeting. They should do something positive. And if Fowler gets a few quid out of the job, Good luck to him. He's not such a bad guy. Is he? he just rubs people up wrong way, doesn't he? But, yeah. Uh, but I, I wish Groves all the best, and I mean that because he has had a tough career, and uh, I wish I wish James DeGale all the best. We don't hear out from him now, do we? George had a really strange career, Russ. I was thinking about this yesterday when I was reflecting on Lopez versus Lemachenko, which had a lot of echoes of Frotch Groves 1, if you, if you really look at it. Yeah. George, does, apart from the, the, the Gale win, what other win does George have where you're like, oh, that was good? Uh, I don't really know, to be honest. We're struggling, aren't we? We're struggling, yeah, for elite wins on his record, yeah. Chudding off. Wasn't elite. I know. It was life and death as well, wasn't it? Yeah. So George has done really, really well. Yeah. And De Gale, what what elite wins has De Gale got on his record? I'm going to give him Durrell. Yeah, but I'm, who, who took Durrell zero? Yeah, but who didn't deserve to take Durrell zero? Listen, mate, you don't come to Nottingham to win a WBC, stinking the arena out, losing points for holding. That's not how you win world titles, is it? And running on back foot. Oh, you're being negative here, man. I Durrell... Was I was sat ringside, <laughs> mate. Durrell stunk Nottingham out that night. Uh, I think Carl did. Why didn't Carl stop him? <sighs> he was running, wasn't he? Backwards all the time. He was like Forrest Gump in reverse. 
uh, I, this is, it's a conspiracy. This is an anti Dural conspiracy. Right, you could say. give you could give him Butte, couldn't you? But who took Butte zero? Groves beat De Gale, and who took Groves zero? Carl Froch. I mean, people keep saying Carl Froch swerved De Gale. De Gale lost against Groves, and Froch knocked Groves out twice and took his zero. So James so, so, is another one, a millionaire. But you'd struggle to give me a good win on his CV, wouldn't you? Yeah. Uh, look, I'm with you on this. A lot of guys seem to have had very carefully manufactured careers. Callum Smith. He... Callum Smith's another one. Who was his best win? A shot grows. Exactly. The one guy who stands out and you say you can't question his record is still the Cobra. Although he did get he did get to running when Fury stuck it on him in the States. Do you remember that? Oh, that didn't happen, mate. It didn't happen, the mates. Nah, it did. Didn't happen, mate. I lost him. Didn't happen. It did. Listen, what, what, what? Carl's lying, man. Like Fury put it on him. Carl was like, "Listen, I mean, you, you keep the bag down your trousers for God's sake." You love it, don't you, Terry? Yeah, no, Carl said it. There was, what was it? You guys, there's sniffer dogs by the changing rooms. I can't be walking around with this. Listen, mate. If you look at Carl Zaggy and Frotcher's career and Amir Khan's career, they fought the best of the best. But this era now. I mean, even Ricky Hatton, you, you'd struggle to, to have great names on his CV because the big ticket seller, they want to keep him earning. No, no, wait, wait, hold on. No, no, but Ricky was in there with the best. Yeah, he was in there with the get. best, but he, what, he's only got one win, hasn't he? Costa Zoo. Yeah. yeah, but I'll give him credit. Though. I'll say at least you had to go. Didn't he fight like Castillo? Was it Castillo Corrales he fought? Yeah, De Dennis put that fight on, didn't he? Yeah, so... so my thing is, Russ, I don't mind if you lose. As long as you're in that mix. Like Amir Khan, you can't question, no. you can't question Khan's CV. We'll give Carl Zaghi a, 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 a tick. Froch, Amir Khan, Ricky Atten, just. Who else yeah. now after them? Nazim Ahmed? No, 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 no. Lennox. Lennox, Lewis and Naz. So you've got seven fighters there, but oh, 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 where's the eight fighter? Callan Smith, Warrington? No. Warrington, yeah, yeah. Who's Warr Warrington swerved nobody? Yeah, like, you remember what? Yeah, but Warrington for me needs a big win in America to get in Agreed. that mix. To get in that yeah. mix, he needs like a Valdez. But, but come on, needs Billy Joe. Could you put Billy Joe in that mix? No, no, not yet, no. not yet. No, no, I don't think he'll Callum ever be in that. Smith. Callum Smith, Billy Joe, Callum really. Needs to rematch Ryder, doesn't he? I mean, Joe Gallagher's screaming about rematches for Jonas Harper, but yet the, the Callum Smith one against Ryder were even worse, the scorecards. But yet Joe Gallagher's dismissed John Ryder like he's garbage. Am I right? Only, only viable fight for Callum Smith right now. He's John Ryder, and John Ryder mm -hmm. wants to fight. So why aren't they giving John Ryder his, his, his date with Callum Smith? And let them both be active and earn a few quid. And just carry on from where they last fought. Because you've got Joe Gallagher there in people's ears. Because they've had good money with WBSS. So, Billy Joe, Callum, they need they need a, a, a couple of wins. They need Canelo or they need each other. Uh, Warrington needs a big win in America. Shaka Stevenson, if Warrington beats him, he'll go down as an all-time great. Like the other... Oh. We just mentioned. <laughs> I don't know if he's an all-time great, but funny oh, hell, that's what if he wrong. beat Shaka Stevenson, Josh Warrington? What would he be then? Thirty an hour, thirty-one an hour. Are you telling me he won't be an all-time great? Every English British Commonwealth European world, he's number one boxer. Nah. If he beats Stevenson, nah. then he's an all-time great man. Nah. nah, he'd have to go up to one thirty and fight someone like Burchelt for me. You got to fight someone people are scared of, like Burchelt. That's the guy. A lot of people, are, you see how people don't mention Miguel Burchelt at 130 pounds? No one does. That because they know what happens, <laughs> like he'll take your soul. If he does, if he beats Shakur Stevenson and Miguel Burchelt, he, he's maybe one of the greatest British fighters of all time. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Interesting. Exciting times ahead. We'll finish off then on punditry. Mr. Bean, you thought you were going to get away, didn't you, Bean? You thought you were going to get let off, Mr. Bean. We've got you. Right. What do you think to the punditry? Macklin, Bean, Nelson. I mean, Nelson's coming out yesterday defending Terry O'Connor. I mean, is he just trying to wind me up, Johnny Nelson? 
He's giving me an ulcer. Where's the punditry going now? And and that goes for BT as well. We Paul Dempsey, David A, and the rest of them. What what's are they just protecting their own corners? These these pundits, or is the bias now out of control? So I'll tell you what, right? I, I watched Lomachenko Lopez, and that made me realize how good Ab- Adam Smith actually is. I quite like Adam Smith on commentary now because I realize the alternative is probably worse. The, the issue <laughs> for me, the issue with Adam Smith is that he's got Macklin next to him. He needs someone like Carl because Adam Smith and Carl Frosch is a good dynamic because Adam's always trying to play it down the middle. And Carl will just be like, no, nah, I don't know about this, man. <laughs> this isn't a good fight. Yeah. You, know, you, need, you need that sort of tension. I think co- when you've got Adam Smith and Macklin, it's a bit too corporate. So you need someone like a Carl on there to... Like a Roy Keane. <laughs> yeah, to just shake it up a bit because Carl will say what the fans are thinking. And sometimes you just want that. You want, you want to know that you're not going mad. And so I'm okay with that. I'm okay with Johnny. I think Johnny has a... Johnny's like the social worker in that group, isn't he? That's how I describe him. <laughs> yeah. Johnny's like the social worker. He just makes sure everyone's okay and everyone feels good. So I, I like having Johnny there. I thought Bellew was decent on Saturday, even though O'Hara was, dig- <laughs> O'Hara was digging him out live on Sky Sports. And you can see Bellew getting... You can see him getting more and more annoyed. <laughs> oh, uh, what, what do you mean digging him out on live? Why it coming up on the screen? No, no, but so he took him out yeah. after, didn't he? No, no, no. So you were watching the fight, and Bell, you and O'Hara tweeting each other between the rounds. You can, you can, you can read it because you're reading it in real time. And you're watching the fight, and so you're waiting for Bell, you to come in and give his analysis, and then so Bell, you fires a little shot at O'Hara and goes, "Look, I think they were talking about uh, who was it who didn't quit, and you got put down on Saturday." Uh, with Joe Laws, no, I think it was was it Ashback case Ashback? Oh, right, yeah, no, 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 you're right, it was Joe Laws, and he was like, Look at Joe Laws fighting to get up. He's like, Not he, I mean, he what's he say? He goes, Like 90% of fighters, you know, I mean, he, he wouldn't dare quit. He said something like that on TV, and I'm like, Oh, he's firing shots at O'Hara, and then O'Hara starts tweeting again. I was like, These guys are going at it, and you can see Bellew just getting pissed off on TV. Did O'Hara say that Bellew's missus could eat an apple through a letterbox or something? She's had a teeth done, hasn't she? So there were some digs at her, weren't there? And some homophobic, some about, she said some homophobic or something. I don't no, know. she did. After the Usyk fight, she went on like a homophobic rant. Did she? Yeah. That, that's, that's not even a myth. I think there's a video of it, Porky. Has she got big gnashes like? Because I don't think I've ever seen her. No, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I think O'Hara was just. I mean, he, he just got into Bellew's head and then he just kind of stayed there. Because he blames him about that Hillsborough thing because Bellew were one of them that were in Earn Zero over that, wasn't he? Yeah. And, and I still feel he was hard done by over that. Yeah, how do it happen before he were born and he never mentioned Hillsborough, he just mentioned the son. But what people forget is, if you go look on what Frank Warren shows back in the day, Tony Bellew were chief support with Paul Smith on a son, her son sponsored show, but uh, with Sports Network back in the day, do you know what I mean? Yeah. So how could Tony Bell you have a go at O'Hara for digging the sun out? Because the because they all hate the sun in Liverpool, but yet Tony Bell you and Smigger Smig were fighting on sun sponsored cards because Warren had a column in sun, didn't he? So people in glass houses shouldn't throw pebbles. <laughs> Or house bricks in O'Hara's case, because he threw an house brick at them, didn't he? Oh, mate. <laughs> well, you just goes with whatever suits him, whatever suits his narrative. What's Look, Tony Bellew looks after Tony Bellew. We know that, don't we? We know how he sold us the David A fight, how it were based on hate. Then they loved each other after. Then it went to hate because at rematch, and A pulled out, and it was even bigger hate. Then it went to love now the best mates. Two biggest combat in boxing, and they'll both fight again. Mark my words. They're just looking for the right narrative and the right angle to get back in because they don't have to make weight, do they? Uh, David has to make. Like, you see how much weight he's lost? No, I don't. I don't. Tony Bellew looks as big as an house. He looks about 58. 
You see the size of Tony Bellio lately. Yeah, well, I mean, whatever you've lost, Porky, he seems to have gained. Listen, mate, I'm 14 stone eight this morning, another four pound off, and I'm cruiserweight. I'm coming for Spencer Fearham, mate. I've still oh, got man. his email. When I get down to two hundred pounds, Spencer, let's get at it. Four pound to go, Spencer. So get get yourself in shape. You you still going up to trade with Freddie Roach when this fight gets? I around. don't need Freddie Roach with him. I've got Mick Whale in my corner. Right, Spencer Fearon. We'll 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 not miss Spencer Fearon after today's blast. Uh, Spencer Fearon is impressing me lately with his commentary. No, he's good. He's always been good. Why weren't he like that at Sky? Were you never given the chance? He was like that on Satanta. Well, I've been watching him on MTK, and do you know what? I watched it with a few of my pals, and everybody were like, oh, God, it's Spencer Fearon. And then after, they were like, he's really good. And sh- it shocked me we, how, how, he, how he broke everything down. Do you think that because he's a bit out there, he never really got in the mix at Sky and they sort of welcomed Macklin to into the fold after Spencer and he got shoved out a bit, didn't he? So Spencer's not corporate. That's the problem. Macklin is. Macklin will put on the the tweed jacket and the V-neck jumper mm-hmm. and the and the brogues. I mean Macklin will, will do what he has to do. Like yeah. he'll he'll do that. Whereas Spencer Fearon's not really like that because you know he's pinned himself to the whole South London thing. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, and I think that's what happened. But I think his challenge was on toe to toe. He was just a bit too extra on toe to toe. So people were just like, "Nah, I'm not. I'm not feeling this guy." And Sky normally go off stuff like that. So I think if he does a good job on MTK, you'll start to see him on other platforms. Well, let me tell you this: I watched him. I've watched him a few times now, and I think he's got some. I think he's got some. I think he's all right. I, I just think he's been kept in cupboard, hasn't he, too long at Sky? He's not been given that proper chance, has he? I want Jim Watt to come back. Do you? Yeah. That's when boxing was real. And Glenn McCrory. Ah, uh, Super Glenn. Super Glenn. Interesting. Right then, listen, I'm going to get off and get this uploaded and we'll get it out there. Uh, All right, mate. Thanks for coming on, Terry. You've been a gentleman. Yeah, no worries, Tom. I know you're busy in that, um, but thanks for coming on and uh, have a great day, my friend. No, it's me. Don't have nightmares. Bye bye. On top of nightmares. Bye bye. <laughs> I take care of it. Bye. Right then, that were uh, Terry. Uh, I enjoyed that. Uh, good little boxing chat on a Wednesday morning. It's now ten to eleven. So let's see how quick I can get this up there and get it out there. And then I can go bed my new tip in on my snooker cube. All right. So peace out. Keep on trucking. Keep supporting boxing. Shout out to Innovation Alloys and South Yorkshire Packaging. All right. That's for you, Steve Wellings and uh, Smido, Andy Patterson. All right. Peace out.